Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. We're now going to turn to T to C movement. We've already talked about this transformation before, uh, highlighting it in uh, various arguments about uh, functional categories. Uh, this is the operation that happens to cause subject aux inversion. In this, um, in this particular approach, subject aux inversion involves moving whatever happens to be in the T position into the C position around the subject, which is in the specifier of the TP. Let's look at this in some more depth. So effectively, what we have here is we have a head, which is a complementizer, which is marked as plus Q, indicating that this sentence is going to be a question. We have no content here in the complementizer in English, unlike other languages where you may have a particle, so we have to do subject aux inversion in order to uh, correctly um, spell out or produce something in the C position to indicate that it's a question. We do this by moving the head T into the head C. This is another instance of head to head movement, T to C, around the subject. Um, again, as we've mentioned in previous videos, an alternative notation is to mark the place where the word begins um, with a T, uh, an italicized lowercase t, to indicate trace, and then put the word where it surfaces. These two notations are equivalent. Um, let's talk a little bit about what evidence we have for this. So is it really T to C movement? Well, one thing we could note is that subject aux inversion is not allowed when you have an embedded question complementizer. Um, so for example, you can in fact do subject aux inversion um, in an embedded clause if there's no complementizer. You can say, I asked, have you squeezed the Charmin? But the minute you put in a question complementizer, like whether or if, subject aux inversion becomes ungrammatical. So I, if I ask, I asked whether you have squeezed the Charmin, the, um, the uh, subject and the auxiliary have not inverted when we have that question word, whether. Um, when you, and if you do, in fact, try and subject aux inversion in this context, uh, you get an ungrammatical form. I asked whether have you squeezed the Charmin. Terrible. Why should this be ungrammatical? It's ungrammatical because whether is um, occupying the position that have would have to move into. So when you have an overt question complementizer in an embedded clause, you can't have subject aux inversion. This is evidence that what we're doing here is moving the T node into the C node. Now there's an interesting property here, which is the interaction between V to T movement and T to C movement. So recall from our previous video that we claimed that in French, both main verbs and auxiliaries are in T. So verbs have undergone uh, V to T movement. Now an interesting prediction of this is that if you have T to C movement in a language that has V to T movement, main verbs will in fact undergo subject aux inversion. And this is indeed the case. So let's look at how you form a yes-no question in French. If you have an auxiliary, it's just like English. Avez-vous mangé des pommes? Uh, the, the, um, the auxiliary has inverted with the subject. Just ignore the hyphen. That's a convention of French orthography. So this is, um, this is a grammatical form. What's surprising, though, is that in French, unlike English, to form a yes-no question when you have a tensed main verb, you simply invert the main verb and the subject as well. You can say, mangez-vous des pommes, which is ungrammatical in English. In English, you can't say, eat you the apples. So it looks like main verbs invert with subjects in yes-no questions as well. Why should this be the case? Well, it actually is a consequence of the fact that French, but not English, is a V to T raising language. So we argued in a previous ver uh, video that in French, verbs move into the tense position in French. 
They don't do so in English. And then as, as a consequence, when you do T to C movement, you're going to take that main verb along with it, and you get mangez-vous des pommes. In a language like English, by contrast, the verb has not raised into the T mode, so you are not going to get main verb subject to accent version. So this is, this is what happens in English. Um, auxiliaries are going to be in the T node, and they undergo uh, subject to accent version, or T to C movement. But because main verbs have not moved into T, they are not going to undergo subject to accent version. Uh, this is a nice result that ties the two things we have claimed together. It ties the V to T and the T to C movement together. One last thing to talk about, which is do support and questions. In, the, in uh, a previous video, we talked about do support in negatives and emphatics, but we left aside the issue of how do support in questions works. Why should we get do support in English? Well, it's critical that the reason we do do support in English is that we do not do V to T movement. So um, V to T movement would put a main verb in a, in a tense, uh, in a T node, um, in a language like French, but in English it, that just doesn't happen. That means that in many cases in English, we have both a null tense node and a null complementizer. Now, if you're trying to indicate what, uh, that a sentence is a question by uh, doing subject to accent version, and you have nothing in the T node and nothing in the C node, what are you going to do? The solution is do support. Do support effectively puts something into the T node, a dummy verb, so that it can undergo subject to accent version and indicate the question. Uh, so this is, there's a rule here, which is the rule of do insertion, which says insert a do to provide phonological content to a T node if it has to move to C plus Q. This is, um, this is a little bit like our expletive insertion rule, except on verbal structures. So you'll recall our expletive insertion rule inserted uh, uh, an expletive into the structure when the extended projection principle, or EPP, uh, was going to be violated. This rule inserts a do into the structure so to make sure that we have something in the T node so that it can undergo T to C movement in questions. Um, so let's talk uh, just briefly about the model we have so far. Um, what we have are really two um, main structures. We have a lexicon, which is a list of words and all the idiosyncratic properties of those words. And we have the X-bar rules, which will assemble those words into sentences. The lexicon plus the X-bar rules is called the base. Now the base um, uh, is going to create a structure called the D structure. The D structure is constrained by the theta criterion. So the D structure is the thing where you check to make sure all your theta roles and all the other selectional properties are met. So it's going to make sure, for example, that verbs have a complement if they require a theme. Um, now, where do transformational rules apply? Transformational rules apply after the D structure. The D structure, which historically was called the deep structure, but for a variety of reasons we've shifted the name, um, uh, is sort of the underlying or base structure that we create, and then the transformational rules move things around. So far we have two transformational rules. We have uh, the rule of V to T movement, and we have the rule of T to C movement. We also have uh, two insertion rules, two rules that will stick stuff in. One is the expletive insertion rule, which sticks stuff, stuff into the specifier of um, TP, and we have the do insertion rule, which is specific to English, which inserts stuff into uh, null T heads when you need to uh, move them. When you apply the transformational rules, the rules that move stuff around, you construct the S structure. This used to be called the surface structure, but again, we changed the name. Um, the surface structure is going to be constrained by things like the extended projection principle, that every sentence have um, a subject, 
and other constraints like, for example, the binding conditions. Um, now it's this S structure that we use to determine whether or not sentences are grammatical or not. So um, this model is one which explains the complex interaction of constraints like the theta criterion and the EPP in that um, the theta criterion uh, and the D structures represent some kind of deep structure, deep um, connectedness of items that are connected via the X bar rules. And then we're allowed to move them around in order to meet certain kinds of constraints. For example, the extended projection principle. So this is our model of grammar that we're gonna use from this point forward. 